It's the two mega stars summer mashup. The awesome iPhone on the Rockstar Metro PCS Network. Get the iPhone you've always wanted for zero dollars, so you can jam without limits. It's a hit. Get an iPhone SE on us when you switch. Metro PCS. Coverage not available in some areas. Plus sales tax and ten dollar activation fee. Requires port and number not currently active on T-Mobile Network or on Metro PCS in past ninety days to an unlimited LTE plan. See store for details and terms and conditions. And tonight, our favorite show is Weeds, brought to you by Genji Cohen and the good people at Showtime. Weeds ran from, uh, it was uh, eight seasons, 102 episodes, and I believe it ran uh, from, uh, let's see here, uh, August 8th of 2005. All the way to ba, 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 July 1st, or rather September 16th of 2012. So, why are we talking about weeds tonight here on TV Party Tonight? As brought to you by your mandated reporter, and frankly, I'm mortified, Mr. Mark Radlidge. Well, here's the deal. Uh, I watched and reviewed Glow with a good friend of the show, Sean Comer. And that's, of course, a Genji Cohen show. We followed that up the fo- about a week later or so with season six of Orange is the New Black. And I found myself missing Genji Cohen type material. I-, I was in a bit of a withdrawal, you'll see. You see. So I was looking around and I'm like, well, what else can I watch that this person has done? And Weeds has been sitting on my Netflix list for quite some time now. The other side of that is that any time we've talked about uh, Glow or Orange is the New Black, Sean Comer constantly, constantly <laughs> <laughs> brings up Nancy Botwin, who is your I'm fucking right. <laughs> uh, your main character from the show <laughs> Weeds. And I finally said, I can't do another show with this man until I find out what this broad did for eight seasons that's got him so hot and bothered. So, oh, stuff it, stuff it with this put-upon, mandated reporter <laughs> business. Of course, it was a fine show you were also missing out on. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, of course, the voice you hear who's fed up with my nonsense is, of course, <laughs> Sean Comer. How do you do, sir? Hi, everybody. I'm Sean. You're not. You're listening to our show. Um, so there you have it. So between the constant references to Nancy Botwin, plus my withdrawal from all things Genji Cohen, I was like, all right, I got to dig deep into this show. And just like when I binge watched Game of Thrones, I started, you know, a little pensive, a little tentative, a little, eh, I don't know about this. I don't know if I'm going to really like this. And, you know, by, by, by the end of the first week of watching it, my wife was like, are you ever going to interact with the family again? That's what happens, <laughs> folks. I fall into a show hole. I don't come up again till we're all done. So uh, we're going to talk about the entire series here of Weeds. Now, Sean, I always like to know what uh, you watched it when it aired on Showtime. You 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 brought this show up uh, consistently. You've also brought up Dexter, which I think was a contemporary of the show. Uh, what was going on with you? What what brought you to the what brought you to Weeds? Well, as it happens at the time. The way I remember it, uh, it's one of those shows that came recommended to me over time by several different people. 
as it happened, this one was suggested by a wonderful, um, incredibly, incredibly wise, intelligent college friend of mine uh, named Abby Simons, who also referred me to Dexter and True Blood. As it happened, I had been looking for – this was back in the day before streaming when Netflix was disc only. Or rather, at the time, I think it was that they had the streaming service, but all you could get were, were these really shitty, god awful B movies. Uh, nothing that nothing that would make you grateful that that was how you would spend ninety minutes to two hours of your life. <laughs> and so I'd been looking for something fresh to check out, and I. You know, remembered hearing vaguely about the show during its first couple seasons and knowing that it revolved around a pot-dealing suburban mom, but really precious little else. And I think it was about... You no, know, how how long into its run is it? I think it was about four or five seasons into its run. And I grabbed the first season in pretty short order, checked it out, and... The the humor, the characters, the fact that Celia Hode reminds me of the woman who once could have very nearly been my mother-in-law, it, it sucked me in within the first episode. Uh, 25 minutes, and I was absolutely 100% hooked. And so I got the second season, then I got the third season, and then I started catching up to the latter ones and I just thought couldn't leave well enough alone could you <laughs> <laughs> you you had the perfect place for it to end but nope the dead horse was not glue yet <laughs> yeah there, there's <laughs> almost two shows here and I want to talk about this right off the bat we all know where my tastes lie. Right now, um, a contemporary show that I'm interested in that pretty much like sums up the kind of show I, I like to watch the most is Snowfall uh, on FX, which is the story, kind of, sort of, maybe, about how the CIA sold uh, crack in Los Angeles. You know, how crack came to Los Angeles. And I don't want to get into whether or not that's a real thing um, or anything else about it, but that's that's the premise of the show. Now... Uh, a big fan of The Wire, The Shield. You know, I like the gritty uh, cop slash drug dealer type shows. So, you know, and I also like a good prison show. Hence my love of Orange is the New Black and Oz. So that that Speaking being said... Speaking of shows one of us never shuts up about. And someday, Go on. And someday <laughs> you can host your own TV party and talk about The Wire. <laughs> Oh, uh, what, one day, one day, we will have a little role reversal, and, uh, you know, we will indeed host a special edition podcast in which Sean finally starts catching up on all the great shows that Mark has been yammering and blah, 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 yakety schmackety about for years. That's right. And then, and then you can go, and then, you know, we can go ahead and just take the piss out of each other. It'll be a whole Freaky Friday thing. Um, I'll tell you, so... The the pitch to, about this show was, well, you know, if you like any of these shows that have to do with drugs and gangs and whatnot, this has sort of the Breaking Bad appeal to it, where it's, you know, or Ozark, you know, where you have the suburbanite that is engulfed in a world, you know, in the uh, world of drugs and crime and whatnot, the, the fish out of water suburbanite type thing. Sort of. Yeah. It's... And so I said, okay, well, I'll give it a shot. And it's like I said, it's it's almost two distinct shows featuring the same cast of characters between seasons one through three and then four through eight. And here's what I mean by that. Um, in the first three seasons, the premise is that you have this widow who is trying to maintain their middle class, upper middle class lifestyle living in this uh, suburban town, uh, pre-planned suburban town of Agrestic. And so looking around at and she she says this later on in the series, much later on in the series. She couldn't, she can't just get a job. I think she was like a dance student when she was in college. She has no skills for which she can apply for a job that would pay her enough to maintain their current lifestyle. So she starts selling pot. So right off the bat, you know, again, kind of like our lead in Breaking Bad, you have somebody who's down on their luck who makes 
uh, who makes a decision to do something illegal for the greater good. And for the first three seasons, I get her point. I really am. I'm sympathetic to Nancy Botwin for seasons one through three. Uh, because I, because I, 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 I believe that she, in earnest, meant to do the right thing, and that she didn't think she was doing any harm, you know, ju- by just selling weed. It's it's seasons four through eight where she has no good reason to keep doing it, and yet she does, and they start bringing out this like danger seeker personality in her, you know, somebody who seems to be just attracted to crime and crime lords that I kind of threw my hands up and went, you're just a terrible character now. I have no Mm -hmm. sympathy for you. And then then the series becomes, let's follow Nancy and her family as she continues to make one terrible mistake after another for no good reason. Um, Which is, again, is entirely different thematically than the first three seasons. So you know what I'm saying, Sean? Like, it, it... the first three seasons for me were a lot easier to watch and understand Nancy's point of view than anything that followed it. Oh, completely. Absolutely. Uh, she just... And here's the thing about weeds. For a certain point, and I would, I would even say this continued up through seasons four and five with certain characters, namely Silas and Shane... The thing that differentiates it so much, in my opinion, from the likes of, say, oh, and I don't, we, we may beg to differ on this a little bit. From you mentioned Breaking Bad and Ozark, is up to a certain point, you see people who feel relatable, genuine pangs of remorse or regret or second guessing about the terrible choices that they've made with Nancy it's like you said you took the words right out of my mouth in fact she just becomes a progressively worse and worse person and learns nothing for every time that consequences slap her in the face just one right after another and the thing is, the other problem with that is, the characters around her, while you feel sorry for them, with the possible exception of maybe Shane, they don't really become better people for anything that they go through. In fact, they just kind of become worse and worse people to the point where even when it comes to them, you want to go, okay, I feel for you. This woman has got the reverse Midas touch. Every piece of gold she touches turns to shit. (laughs) But that doesn't excuse your obvious character flaws either. Silas becomes a bigger and bigger douchebag as he goes on. Um, Andy, pretty much for most of the show continues to be a careless, shiftless, slacker layabout. Doesn't really evolve all all that much. Uh, Celia doesn't learn a goddamn thing for everything she loses. Fuck's (laughs) sake. The woman goes through a divorce. She loses her breast to cancer. She completely and unrepentantly alienates herself from her daughter doesn't change her in the slightest. In fact, you can sum her up entirely with one exchange that she has with Isabel in, I believe, was late in the first season. When Celia has made her recovery from cancer, she's, you know, got her new surgically reconstructed pair of pleasure zeppelins. Uh... You know, she's got a brassy blonde wig and everything, and she's gone from actually coming across for a fleeting moment, like there might be a human being in there, to all of a sudden going right back to being the sometimes borderline sociopath that she is. I was going to say, there's no borderline about it. Yeah. I'm I'm trying to be generous here. (laughs) Um, And Isabel just flat out asks her, so are you sure you're not going to die? 
<laughs> because when you were going to die, you were a much better person. Does it change a fucking thing? Fuck no. Absolutely not. I mean, you know, Kevin Nealon... Kevin Nealon's uh, Doug Wilson character continuing to be kind of a lovable dimwit. Okay, I can live with the fact that he doesn't change. You know, because you, you have to maintain some sense of levity throughout the show. But as for everybody else, you just keep waiting for them to have that moment when something that they've been through or something that they've seen Nancy do, or something that's been inflicted on them, has made them go, wow, I really should probably get my act together and try actually not being an asshole. About the only one who seems to get it is Shane. <sighs> and he has to become a violent, briefly alcoholic little weirdo for a little bit himself before he gets that. And there it's kind of relatable because he's dealing with the fact that he of the two brothers was closest to their late father. And he, he, that really, the death really continues to hit him harder and harder throughout the first two seasons. Um, and finally, after he goes through this rebellious, violent phase and having a few substance abuse problems of his own, he shapes up and eventually and eventually joins the police academy. Which, hey, good on you, kid. Good on you. Um, but it's seemingly rare. And, 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 and Mark, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Did it ever strike you that Nancy felt any of the Walter White-like prolonged misery over everything he had reaped, or over, the, or everything she had reaped, for no. for all her actions. No, that's the thing is is she becomes almost a different character starting in season four. Where season three, I feel like the character was written as to feeling the weight of her decisions and somewhat wrestling with the the ethics of it all. You know, mm -hmm. I think she was trying to keep this part of herself in a in a, in a box. And outwardly project, you know, I'm a mother and I'm a suburbanite and I'm a PTA member and I'm all of these things and I'm really trying to keep it all together and I was not ready for my partner to suddenly leave me holding the bag and all of this. To, you know, you, you talked about Celia. I, I would tell you Nancy's just as much of a sociopath uh, going forward from season four. Quite possibly. I, I don't think she feels the repercussions of her decisions at all, including when she finally leads uh, Esteban and Guillermo into the waiting arms of the police. And, you know, and then they fast forward into the next season with her having served a three-year prison sentence. And, she, you know, and again, she's just a miserable human being. She comes right out and she starts, and she starts yeah. dealing hash. Yeah, uh, immediately. <laughs> <laughs> like, she, if, I, if, if I recall correctly... I believe the way that came about was she got a job as a housekeeper and she then figured out a way to use the, the hotel she the, the dryers at the hotel she worked at to cook hash. That's before. She comes well, out of the she comes out of order? Out, yeah, she this is that's okay. that's where they're that's where they're still on the run. Um Okay. From Esteban. She comes out of prison, she's in the halfway house. And, you know, the halfway house is supposed to be an opportunity for her to get her life together. And she, you know, and it's this, this giant inconvenience for her. And um, I think she, she leans on Doug to get her a job at the, uh, at the hedge fund that he's currently working at. And within, within hours of being there, tries to push the local, uh, local pot dealer out of that, out of the, uh, out of that market so she can take it over. And again, she's in a position... Here's the thing. Throughout seasons four through eight, she had... Any, at any one of those times, she no longer had to deal drugs. They, she didn't have this enormous uh, prefab suburban house to take care of anymore. Right? They were living with... Uh, they were living with her father-in-law. Right? 
So she could have. So she could have gotten a job. And I and I wanted to get to, <laughs> I want to get to the front that she's running in, in a minute because that also annoyed the shit out of me. But the bakery? No, uh, the uh, the maternity store. Oh, gotcha. All right, so. Once they've left Agrestic, she no, you know, the, the argument that, well, I have to do this to maintain our lifestyle no longer applies. They're living with the father-in-law, who then takes off for Europe. They're, so she's living in a house for free. At that point, she could have just gotten a job. And, you know, that would have been it. She chooses to, to, she chooses to hold on to this lifestyle and work for Guillermo. And when Guillermo says, you're really no good to me in any, in any role other than being a proper front, she fights it. And she makes all of these decisions, you know, and goes out of her way and puts herself in harm's way because she wants to be closer to the criminal lifestyle. And it's like, okay, at this point now, you just want to be a criminal. And this is what, and, and, it's, and there's no, and it's almost as if being a mom to Shane no longer matters to her. It's like, well, you know, her, her parting words in season three is, are, are something along the lines of, uh, I'm sorry, Judah, I tried. And I feel yeah. like that line resonates through the rest of the season, uh, through the rest of the series, where it's like, I tried being a mom, I failed, I give up. But And let's, let's, let's play a little game of before and after here, shall we? Um, you, you talk about Nancy's history with fronts. In the first season, when Doug introduces this concept to her, at one point she looks at him with... Mary Louise Parker's endearing softball sized doe eyes. Those big, big, beautiful eyes. And says, Is there a possibility that my front might one day become my real business? I, I genuinely hoping. Wait, you mean to tell. Wait, maybe one day I could do this instead of slinging weed. And. She actually proves to be not exactly terrible initially at running a bakery. You know, she she has a chance, but she goes from that to then having a chance to possibly maybe build up her own successful maternity store. No, fuck that. I'm just going to use that to cover for the weed. I don't want a legitimate <laughs> business. Screw that noise. <laughs> well, that's the thing. They asked her, don't worry about the back. Don't worry about the underground tunnel to Mexico. Just run the store. And even that became too difficult for her. Because <laughs> you know? like, here's where I was going with this. I feel like in the first three seasons, she was trying to be a mom to both Silas and Shane. She really was, in earnest, doing her level best. When it all goes to hell and she burns Agrestic down, with the help of Guillermo, it's almost as if she's resigned to... And this is what I wanted to say before. We have two counterintuitive things going on. On the one hand, I don't think she wanted to be a mom anymore. I don't think she wanted to be a suburban housewife. I think she'd gotten a taste of the crime, uh, the crime world, and said, "This is what I want to be. I want to be a big time drug dealer." Okay. Well, okay. And, and and here's another. Here's another before and after for you. Okay. Um. First season roll. First season rolls around, and Nancy experiences just exactly this very same problem, and gets herself very nearly fucked up over it. Uh, she experiences her first drive-by while she's standing around in Halia's kitchen just, you know, chatting it up with um, uh, her and Conrad and um, Celia's daughter. Uh, I, I forget her name. She's I, played I'm, by I'm Indigo. Yeah, yeah the, one, the, the one played by Indigo. Um, and just rattles the shit out of her and then she finds out that she's being pressured by a rival dealer because she tried to expand onto the local college campus uh, gets threatened with, gets threatened with arrest has her stash taken nearly ends up 14 grand in the hole had Conrad not stepped up unbidden to be her knight in shining wife beater and you know, take and you know, take the uh, the <coughs> redneck small time security guard down. Uh, you would think that would have rattled her. 
you would have think that would have taught her a lesson about not horning in on somebody else's turf, especially everything else that she had been that she had been through. And it apparently did. You see this just exhaustive relief when the whole thing is resolved and the guard comes around, just says, just says, you know, here, take your stuff. I'm sorry, I didn't know who you were. You know, please don't ever have me hurt again. And just a few seasons later, where are we? <laughs> Doesn't fucking learn. No. Again, I, I bring it back to the Breaking Bad comparison, and I see what you were getting at, and it's valid to a point. But by the end of five seasons, you got the impression that Walter White was exhausted. He yeah. was no <laughs> longer proud of what he had done, and he realized that he could no longer escape fate in any sense. Not cancer, not the law, not the loss of his family. Nothing took him... Okay, um, Breaking Bad. About about how long in real time does the show span? What are we talking about? A couple years? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we're, we're talking about, what, two, three years? Something like that? Something like that, yes. Yeah. Yeah, in five seasons, but it goes by in, in semi-real time. In Nancy's case, we're talking about, what, four or five years of the same nonsense, and she still doesn't get it? No, the difference between Dan Nancy and Walter, where at the end, Walter couldn't live with himself with the world that he created, and he attempted to redeem himself in fiery glory. The difference with Nancy, at the end, everyone has left her. She's alone, and she has, and she doesn't. She doesn't seem to know why. She's like, but I, but but I'm Nancy. Like the, the, she never has that moment of repentance. She, See, but but that's the problem with shows with shows like this. Yeah, to a certain extent, there's an appeal where you could say, "Oh, that Nancy, what monkey shines will shines will hear dumb Lily White ask you didn't do next." But the other side of that coin being, after a while, when your characters fail to evolve, it gets dull as shit to just kind of watch them and realize. I don't really feel invested in any of you because almost all of you are awful people. Yeah. What I um what I wanted to draw the comparison to was I said um she doesn't seem to want to be a parent, but she doesn't want any of them to leave her. So it's like she creates situations where Silas and Shane and Andy are you know have to be attached to her in some way. But she doesn't necessarily want to take care of any of them. She doesn't want to... Andy wants... Andy's in love with her. She won't love him back. But she likes the fact that he's following her around wherever she may go. Mm -hmm. She has these two grown sons, okay? But, I mean, by the, by the time we get to season four, Silas could have... Could have... Didn't have to go to Renmar. Silas could have gone anywhere he wanted. He's a grown-ass man. And he, you know, he, he could have long since split from Nancy. Now, at that point, I think Shane's still in high school, so he's still got a little ways to go. But, um, you know, so the I, I'll make an exception for him. But when they go to Copenhagen, he, you know, it, we have the same issue here. Now everyone's an adult. Nobody here has to depend on Nancy. And yet, like, like, like little puppy dogs, they all come running home the moment she's out. And she even avoids them. <laughs> like, I don't... Like, it... it I mean, granted, it's a show, and they have to write it to where they're all back together again. That's the whole appeal to this thing. I get that. But if you were if you were to sort of look at this and say, like, well, what if this were reality? I don't think Nancy would have ever gone and looked for her two sons again. I think, she, like, she, she satisfied the need to be a mom with Stevie Ray... And at that point, she almost no longer had any use for Silas or Shane. Which makes mm -hmm. season seven the most frustrating and awful season of the whole thing. This is the one where they're in New York, and the whole 
uh, the whole thing centers around her and Silas feuding over the New York pot business. Mm. To the point where they're sabotaging each other. And I'm like, okay, so whatever, whatever hook there was in this family being together and muddling through and dealing with the consequences of her actions is now gone. And she's just an asshole. Surrounded by people who they have to write, you know, they have to write them jumping through herps and hoops and, you know, and writing circles around to try to figure out how they're going to keep them all together. There's not a single, this is, and this is where I'm going to make a comment about the writing. About season seven, the writing really falls off for me because there's no good reason why any one of those characters should have gone back to her. Maybe Shane. Shane probably is the only link in that he murdered somebody for her. <laughs> I'll give him that much. But so, why Silas left Copenhagen, there was no rational reason for. Why Andy went back to her, there was no rational reason for. And might I say, after season three, I don't, even, I don't understand why Kevin Nealon was still on the show. Like I feel, <laughs> I feel like that was a note from Showtime, you know, where they pitched season four. They were like, okay, the family's on the run. They're going to go live in San Diego. We're going to bring Albert Brooks on the show. It'll be a whole thing. And somebody on Showtime said, hey, Kevin Nealon tests really well for some other reason. Figure out a reason for him to follow them to San Diego. <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, it... Uh, up to a certain point, Nancy ceases to be a character, and she just becomes a thing that happens to people. Yeah, very much so. She's she's a force of nature, and, and a yeah. negative one, to, to say the least. I want to take a break from beating up on Nancy and talk about Celia. Because uh, what what I think is masterful about the show is that as much as we're, we're beating up on Nancy, and there's a lot to mm -hmm. dislike about her from season four on... She's still a charismatic character. I would, you know, she's kind of got that Hulk Hogan quality, where even if you want to hate him for all the bullshit that he's done, he's still got such, he just oozes such charisma. It's kind of hard to. Um, mm -hmm. what, I, what, what I like about the writing, for the most part of the show, is that all of the characters have this sort of needle uh, embedded on them to where they're despicable and they're likable, and they're despicable and they're likable. They're relatable, and then they're completely sociopathic. And so I think the biggest example of that is Celia, who started out as a character who I'm like, oh, I'm going to hate this character. Uh, the, the, this character was absolutely written to be a nemesis for Nancy. And then you find yourself thinking nobody should go through. The, nobody, even as a, as a deplorable woman as she is, should go through what she's going through. You know, like I truly felt sympathy for her in bits and pieces throughout the show. And then it's almost like your reward for feeling any kind of sympathy and being with this character is for them to make a final decision that's so awful and so stupid and so bad. You're just like, why did I ever feel bad for you ever? You know, her decision to out drug deal Nancy and you know, try to become a kingpin <laughs> in her own right. I was, I just found myself like if I had had paper in my hands, I would have just thrown him into the air in frustration. <laughs> I uh, personally, I was, and again, this is this is going back to the difference between the early seasons and the later ones. I actually thought the episode in which uh, she and um, not Doug, um, her husband. Oh, again, I'm blanking on names tonight. Her husband is that who you're you're struggling yeah. with? Yeah. Uh, Dean. Dean, thank you. I knew it was something with a D. Um, when she and Dean are just having this, and they keep cutting back to it, this series of knockdown, drag out arguments about their about their failing marriage, just one after another after another. And I think I enjoyed it so much because. It was easily one of Celia's most dynamic individual episodes because, you know, coming from coming from parents who, you know, fought quite a bit when I was growing up myself, that that cats and dogs atmosphere really is there. But then there is also that sentiment of them both realizing, you know, they weren't all bad times. Um. And you get to see that play out, and it's it's really the most 
human. Either of them really seem at times throughout the entire show. With, with the lone possible exception of that being uh, when Celia finds out she has cancer. And even then, that one just kind of spins out into her just going truly almost comically off the rails. Like, like it, it becomes exaggerated. Just kind of how, just how far down the rabbit hole she goes. But I don't know. I mean, am I am I pretty much right about Dean that he more or less just kind of remains a bit of a schlub the entire season series, or did I miss something? No, he. Um, I thought the most interesting thing about Dean. And it was one of those classic, as we're finding out, Genji Cohen things where they, she serves you up an hors d'oeuvre of something and you're like, ooh, this is a tasty little pig in a blanket. I'd like more, please. There isn't any more. What do you mean? Well, that was it. it was, I literally spent 12 hours making one, pig, one delightful pig in a blanket. You know, as, <laughs> as, as, as Scarlet once said to me in kind of a measure of annoyance, stop feeding me crumbs and just give me the damn cake. So the the pig in the blanket that I'm referring to is when uh, Nancy goes back to Halia, um, and I believe season seven to hook up with her and sell um, <clears throat> milf weed again. And mm-hmm. Dean's living with and Dean's living with Halia, and they allude to a relationship between them, but they don't ever take it any further, and it's subsequently dropped after that. <laughs> and then the next time you see Dean. I want to say is at uh, Stevie's bar mitzvah where he talks about um, uh, Isabella becoming Bruce. There's no mention of Celia, and there's nothing, and they they don't pick up on the on the strain, uh, the thread of what happened with him and Celia. But it was like that was the most interesting thing they had introduced that entire season, in my opinion, and it was it was just like. It, it, you know, in volleyball terms, it was kind of like they bumped it, and then everyone just sort of turns and walks away, and the ball falls on the floor. And this was our complaint about Glow and Orange is the New Black as well, where Genji Cohen sometimes introduces a really interesting thread, and then goes, "Are you? Are, are, do you like it? Is it? Is it nice? Do you like it? Okay," and then walks away from it. You're like, "Well, what are you going to do with it? I, why is it out there?" <laughs> And I don't know if it's purposely poor writing on her part, or you know, or does or is she just like, well, we don't really have anything, you know. <laughs> Sorry, creative has nothing for you, pal. And then they, you know, just, they just walk away. I, I, I don't know if Genji Cohen is actually a wrestling fan, but if she is, I just I just have this sense that she watched that that one moment on SmackDown where Booker T got the note that says. I still know what you did. And she just went, genius. I love this show. This is the paragon of television writing. <laughs> we'll just throw, we'll just occasionally throw something out of left field on the screen, let it sit there and promptly never acknowledge it again. Perfect. Lobster. Yes. Yes. You know what? I. I, I, I like to imagine that at some point she sits there and just wishes that GTV had been her idea. <laughs> um, not not because she could have done it differently, because she would want credit for doing it exactly the same way. So I'm just curious. Do, do you – can you defend, rationalize in any way why any one of the men in her life stayed with her after season three? Like, you know, and, and I'm talking specifically about Shane no, – not Shane. Um, I'm talking specifically about Silas and Andy. What? Why in your? I mean, I guess in I guess in terms of construct, they needed Andy because it's his father that they're you know that they're living in the house of. So you kind of need Andy there at least for that initial connection. But as as season four rolled into five and all of the things that happened therein, especially when you have Silas even saying, "I just want to start my own, you know, pot dispensary. I want nothing to do with you." Well, go be your own man then. Go go live somewhere else. Go go be a thing. Go go do a thing. I'm just wondering if if you have any ideas as to you know, from a writing standpoint, why you think uh, it's defensible that they kept these characters attached to Nancy. It really isn't. 
Okay. It is it is indefensible because. One of the best examples I can point to is uh, one of my other favorite shows. And don't worry, I'm not going to harangue you for years on end that you need to check this one out, although I would highly recommend it. <laughs> um, and that was the uh, the FX drama Damages. Okay. Uh, stars Glenn Close as, man, shark is almost too cuddly a word to to, to describe the uh, the civil attorney that she plays, but the way that played out, and granted, it was an entirely different show. This was a dark drama. It was not a dramedy. There are no bones about that. But Patty Hughes also systematically runs everybody she loves out of her life behind the force of her own ambition which is just an absolute runaway train um unfortunately it's also one that's often driven that's often running with no conductor but at the end of the show there is no a happy go happy go lucky resolution where everybody gathers back around her and everyone comes back into her life and nobody can really let her go because oh they just love her so much no she has ruined people they have remembered it and they have walked away and the show ends with her being maddeningly successful but clearly also alone and it's it, it plays out in such a way over the course of the, oh, I think it ran five seasons, that you can't really argue with it. You know, th- this is not a woman that deserves a happy ending. Everything she did, she 100% did to herself. Just the same as Nancy. You know, and sometimes that's the bitter real pill that you have to swallow. I think what they were going for here was something that myself and a lot of other people with flawed parents keep coming back to, and that is we have a hard time letting go entirely because some hopeful part of us still remembers the better times and wants to believe that it's possible to turn things around so that that is all we have from that point forward or at least that's all that we end up being able to choose to remember and sometimes you know some families can make some families can make that work in this instance it just doesn't seem plausible just considering just the the sheer scope of how much Nancy puts them through. She burned down a suburb. (laughs) She didn't just burn down their house. She burned down the neighborhood. The whole fucking thing. She chases people off. She chases people off. She gets an, okay, admittedly corrupt, DEA agent killed. She puts people's lives at stake with her own... with her own recklessness, she forces her family to basically live like a band of gypsies and instead of actually settling in and trying to make things right and get a fresh start, no, she figures that the prob- that the whole problem was that she had a good plan badly executed <laughs> and that she can somehow fix it. She is John fucking Hammond. <laughs> The Velociraptor could be chewing her tits off, and she would insist, no, this was not a bad idea. Now, next time. <laughs> right. I, I, I want to talk a little bit about Kevin Nealon for a second, just because, you know, in, in the hour that we have to discuss this, he's a main character for all eight seasons of the show, five of which he's utterly useless. But specifically, they make a decision with him. 
And it had me thinking of some other shows where something happens and it's so... Like, it, it's entirely realistic that somebody would, would decide, I'm going to engage in a criminal enterprise for the betterment of my family. It's not a decision everyone would make, but certainly some people do make that decision for better or for worse. And so there is a degree of relatability and believability in Weeds to a point. And that point is where Doug starts a cult. (laughs) (laughs) You ever have just one of those moments where you're watching a TV show, you're like, okay, I'm with you, I'm with you, I'm with you, I'm with you, I'm in the fucking ditch, and you've, you've, you've taken off without me, I cannot go with you any further. The, the... You know, the fact that he's sort of a corrupt CPA who likes to get high and is just, you know, sort of American beautied with his own life, if you know what I mean. If you've ever, you know, I'm sure you've seen the movie with Kevin Spacey. You oh, know, sure. the whole movie's about midlife crisis and uh, just sort of looking at the mirror and seeing, you know, and seeing the reflection back is, this, you know, this pale suburbanite, dead eyed, uh, dead eyed comer goer. And it's like, okay, I, I get that. Boy has, boy has Hollywood had a time with that particular motif. Okay? Um, if you were to believe Hollywood, all of, us, all of us middle-aged white men hate our fucking lives and are this close to killing ourselves. Um, or, <laughs> not, or, all of us are, not all of us are unfortunately so close to sticking it in Mina Subari. <laughs> um, you know... But uh, and then you have so you have this Kevin Nealon character who's much of the same thing, and it's fine for a few seasons. And he's and you're right, he's great comic relief. At which point, it's like I can't remember a good example of this, but it's right on the tip of my tongue. Where you have a character who started out moderately dumb. Okay, like Homer Simpson. Okay, he's probably a good example of this. Homer mm-hmm. Simpson, the first mm-hmm. couple of seasons of The Simpsons, is just a, is oafish, but he's not altogether stupid. Same he's a lovable oaf. The same thing with Peter Griffin. Peter Griffin is supposed to be a mo- a, a, a mock uh, a mocking uh, character of the TV sitcom Dad. It's not until later seasons that he's certifiably retarded. Yeah, it, or you know, in the Simpsons case, enter jerk ass Homer. Right. You know, it, it, I think it's later seasons in the Simpsons where Ho- you know where Homer's having arguments with his own brain. Um, mm. You know, in. And I think they even said on The Simpsons, over the years, they've just made him dumber and dumber and dumber. And that's kind of what happens with Kevin Nealon on the show, where it's like the first three seasons, he's just kind of a, you know, a dead-eyed suburbanite who, who's just trying to find a way to get through his humdrum life. And then he decides he's going to follow Nancy because she's making good life decisions. <laughs> and... And he appears to be just on the sh- He appears to be like Mitzoplex. He's just on the show to cause <laughs> fucking chaos. You know, Silas has a perfectly good dispensary going, eh, I'm going to eat up the profits and smoke them. All right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The family's on the run. He essentially becomes Andy's fucking sidekick. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, and, then, and then when he's in New York... You know, he's just, he's like, like, we want you to be a CPA. I don't want to be. I'm kind of done with that. He's like, yeah, but here's an opportunity to use steroids and cookbooks. Sure, basi- why not? He, he basically becomes Quagmire. He becomes Norton. Mm-hmm. He, beca- he becomes, oh, what was, what was the name of the womanizer from Three's Company? Oh, gosh. Um, I remember the name of the bar. It was the Regal Beagle. But uh, Jack and oh, I know who you're talking about. But okay, the womanizer from Three's Company, neighbor. Got yeah, it. yeah, that guy. That, that's basically he becomes the wacky neighbor with the the wacky neighbor with the get rich quick schemes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> He's Mrs. Ockmonic from Elf. Yeah, there you go. There you <laughs> Just go. progressively weirder and weirder and weirder to the point where it's not even self parody anymore. It's just you're just one you're just one walking gag, you know. And and at the point where he has such cult of personality that he actually literally forms his own cult, I'm like, I the show has lost all believability for me. You know, at least Nancy was made to, at least on paper, pay for her crime. She did three years in prison. You know, she's had to start from the bottom again. She suffers losses. 
Mandy, you know, for, for all of her bad mistakes that she makes, for all of her choices, Nancy suffers. I don't think Doug ever suffered. <laughs> to be uh, like, to, uh, or at least he had any kind of self awareness that he could acknowledge the suffering, and then to give him in writing such a reward that somehow, like, this, the, what somehow he had this inner quality to where people would follow him in his nonsense. I'm like, okay, if you're tr- if you're writing a joke, a, a very complex and extended joke, fine. Some people might look at this and be entertained by by Kevin Nealon being a cult leader. I just looked at it and I was like, well, this seems to be an exercise in jerking off. <sighs> Doug Wilson is a character that would have been greatly improved by actually having a laugh track just for him. Because <laughs> at least then you would have gotten the impression, fuck it, at least they're being honest about it. Right. Yeah, he... Uh... It's like one of those bits on Family Guy where where they actually have the audience track. <laughs> yeah, yeah, precisely. But but no, the um, God, I, I I hate to use an axiom so try to jump the shark, but my but my God, that moment when he starts the cult, it's just wee. <laughs> oh, hey, Bruce. You get the feeling after about season five. Genji Cohen really wanted to just end the show <laughs> and Showtime was like no you can't this is still winning for us figure out something to do and season 6, 7, and 8 are her and her writing team just throwing shit at the board to see what would stick you know what it's it's like when an already shitty Chuck Lorre comedy hits about 12 seasons Past a certain point, there are just expectations, you know. Yeah, I definitely get the, feel, the, the I definitely get the feeling after two seasons in Renmar, you know, from you know they go they going going on the run, and then hey, we haven't done New York yet, and then well, we got to wrap this up. Um, it, you know, I, honestly, the the show could have ended a couple of different times. Obviously, burning down a grass stick, it really should have been the end of the show, but it goes for two more seasons with Shane killing. Uh, Shane killing the woman and then going on the run probably could have ended there. Season six is a fucking waste. Um, it could have ended at the end of even seven with, you know, who shot Nancy and just leaving it, in, you know, just leaving it ambiguous. But I'll tell you, it, it led to one of the moments that made me hate Nancy as a character. She makes one decision in, in, um, in the finale season, season eight. Based on uh, based off of her being shot in the head, that made me just utterly hate her as a character, and that mm. is when Shane goes to arrest her uh, her murderer, her attempted murderer, mm-hmm. killer, and she starts sticking up for him. She, you know, to assuage her own guilt, she's willing to take a bullet in the head from the kid and let him go scot free because she feels guilt over her dad over his dad dying, and you know, and this is with respect to her never fully being behind Shane being a police officer. I was like, wow, you're just a shit human being. And I'm glad that at least they saved something as despicable as all that for the last season. But I, it never quite recovers for me. And so at the end, I don't know what you're made to feel. And I guess we'll, we'll start to wrap up after this. I don't know what you're made to feel for Nancy when everyone's decided to leave her and she's just sitting on the back porch silently smoking a joint with the main cast of characters but I was like get it over with already (laughs) you deserve everything you're getting here and probably more just you know this show uh, to kind of ease into our wrap up a little bit was the product of what I consider kind of the golden age of Showtime original dramas um, I, I don't know how many other shows from that period you've watched, but the ones that come to mind are uh, Queer as Folk, which I've never watched, always meant to get around to it, never did. Um, never saw it. Actually, most of the Showtime shows I've never seen. Uh, Californication nope. is another one. Uh, both are available on Netflix, so I have no excuse for not having checked them out. Um, trying to remember if the L word was on around this time. I 
think it was, or I may be a little bit off there. Uh, but the three that I have seen are this are you know obviously oh and uh, Nurse Jackie. Nurse Jackie is another one that I would throw in there. Yeah, Nurse Jackie is on my list. I love Nurse Jackie. You're in for a treat. Um, but of those, Dexter, depending on how you look at it, stuck or, stuck around anywhere from one to three seasons too long. Maybe even, oh, we ran eight seasons. I grudgingly admit that. I kind of like to pretend the eighth doesn't it never happened. It, there's an argument that it could have ended after season four, but I don't think five was all that bad. Um, and even if it had to go on, seven brought it full circle to the very first novel's ending, which would have been perfect because the first season, the entire first season, was a loose adaptation of the plot of the first book. So that would have been a fine place to go on. But no, they dragged it out for one more season and eight was it's irredeemable it, it is unspeakably irredeemably awful and uh, I, I lump it in there with the ninth season of Scrubs as shows where I just say nope didn't happen <laughs> that that, se- that season never happened not even in an it's a fever dream way in a if I decide to rewatch that show I'm not watching the last season I will end this show the way I want to. So that went on a season too long. Uh, Weeds, as we've established by now, depending on how you feel about seasons four and five, it went on anywhere from three to five. The season's way too long. They ran out of track on this story so damn fast. Um, <laughs> three was probably where it should have ju- where it should have just trailed off. Because they just had nowhere interesting or redeemable to go with anybody after that. Of the shows I've seen all the way through to completion, and I admit I haven't, I still have to get through the rest of Nurse Jackie, which I intend to do soon. Uh, United States of Terra, I think, was the one that... Yeah, it ended prematurely, it was cancelled quite suddenly, but somehow the ending of it still pretty much works. The characters, de- the characters developed in meaningful ways for everything that they had been through. Uh, there was a sense of satisfaction with where we were leaving most of them off. Uh, they had grown. They weren't the same people that we started off uh, season one, episode one with. It felt fine. You know, um, to borrow a line from the death of Deadpool, Pool. I can live with this ending. <laughs> I think that's it. I may have I may have that line wrong. Uh, Jesse Starcher, Ben Cologne, If I if I cocked that one up, feel free to point it out to me. Um, but I think I think I got that one right. Um, well. This uh, this one. God damn! I don't know what it. I don't know what it is, but they just had no idea when to stop. When I when I think about TV show endings, uh, you know the three the three characters that I go to that feature most prominently in my head have sort of they got what they deserved at the end of the show. Um, you have McNulty and The Wire, who I don't want to give it away, but you know, by the end of it, he's you know, by the end of all things, he's lost everything and and he and he brought it on himself. Um, same thing with uh, what's his face from The Shield. Uh, Vic Mackey. Vic Mackey. You know, Vic Mackey. It's it's kind of an ambiguous ending, but you, but but up to the point where the ambiguity, you know, with there is ambiguity, uh, he's lost everything. He's lost his family. He's lost his job. Um, he has no attachments, and he's just sort of adrift. And he's brought it on himself. Uh, Walter White's dead. <laughs> Walter White goes out in a blaze of glory. <laughs> but in doing so, at the time that he makes that decision, he has lost everything. Um, I feel like Nancy... Nancy is one of those people who should have lost everything, and in a way she does, but we don't necessarily see it. 
You know, it's alluded to. It's going to happen. Everyone's going to everyone's going to go their own separate way, and she is going to be alone. But the show ends just before that, and I think we're kind of robbed of that McNulty, Mackie, Walter White moment of this is this is where all your decisions led you. Instead, you get this reflexive moment where they're smoking pot on the back staircase, and it's like, hmm, I feel like. For all this talk that we have of the show should have the show ended way too late, the finale ends a little too early for me. Um, I feel like I feel like Nancy should have been back there alone, and I think, think it was a I think it was a missed opportunity, as if to say you know as if Gen- Genji Cohen was very protective of this lead and didn't want her to come across t- didn't want the audience to judge her too harshly, and so. Her, the final images of her with her family around her, even though they won't be there in the next frame. And I'm like, mm, I would have, I would have preferred a more pensive, reflective McNulty Mackie moment. You know, mm-hmm. I don't, I don't know what you think, but that's that's sort of my parting words on the subject. Is you know, it, it, it's an entertaining show, but I feel like unlike the writers of The Wire, The Shield. Breaking Bad, I feel like Genji uh, made it a point to put some protective covering over this treasured character that I don't think deserves it. No, no, she she doesn't, and and again, that's the problem. Few of her characters ever do, and maybe at some point she'll explain in such a way that she goes, "Well, yeah, but that's kind of what I meant." <laughs> is that you know not everybody not everybody gets a moment of redemption some people are just terrible okay why do you think we want to why do you think we want to watch shows where your main characters the ones we're supposed to care so much about just continuously become worse <laughs> it makes me wonder how um how Ruth and Debbie and uh what's her face on Orange is the New Black come on help me uh, which, Piper. What's, <laughs> Piper. Oh, Piper. Okay. I, I was thinking of Glow for a second. I was like, which what's her face on Glow? <laughs> An awesome Kong? What are you talking about? Um, no. <laughs> it makes me wonder how, where we're going to leave Piper, uh, Debbie, and Ruth at, you know, at the end of all things with their respective shows. You know, I wonder if she's, if Genji Cohen has matured as a producer and a writer to where, you know, both shows will end with our leads laid bare. But then again, Piper and and Ruth and Debbie up to this point haven't made nearly the amount, the enormous amount of horrible decisions that Nancy has. You know, in no, in, no. in the pantheon of the Genji verse, uh, Nancy is by far the worst character she's written. Now, all, all things considered, Ruth made one bad decision. Yeah, and she made one decision that she then spent two seasons trying to dig herself out of a hole from. Um, Debbie's bad decisions are mounting fast. <laughs> she's she's <laughs> certainly catching up on Nancy. Uh, she's she's gaining ground. She's nowhere near there yet. But no. yeah, she, she's gaining ground. Piper in the last season. You know what? It was like watching. It was like watching a longtime professional wrestler who spent most of his career as a heel. And, but has become such a legend, such an icon that they're allowed to go out as a face. It was it's it's Andre the Giant at the end of WrestleMania six. I was thinking, you know, I, I was actually thinking, you know, Kurt Hennig, Mister Perfect, you know, where you know at, at at towards the end there, he was just kind of doing a thing, and, and it didn't really matter anymore. His, his best days were behind him. He's just sort of there now, dependable hand, but not really doing much of anything. Mm-hmm. Well, again, I, I kind of go with Andre because, you know, Piper has really spent most of this show as almost an outright villain, mm-hmm. and then right at the end of this mm-hmm. most of this most recent season, um, she finally seems to get it together. Yeah. And it's it's like the moment when Andre finally snaps out of it, and you know dumps Haku over the top rope and starts paint brushing Bobby Heenan, and he gets to ride out of Skydome, 
to the appreciative cheers of the Canadian crowd. It does make me wonder if anyone listening to this podcast ever goes back and tells Genji Cohen how often her shit's compared to professional wrestling. Damn, but that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> and not always in good ways. <laughs> Well, I can't think of any way better way to end this show. So I think that wraps up our discussion of weeds. I've gotten that monkey off my back. I've gotten it all off my chest. I'm prepared to move on with my life. <laughs> Speaking of moving on with my life, um, let's see. We've got an on trial on September 4th for Barb Wire uh, from Pam Anderson. I'm sure that'll be a lot of fun. And I think that's your last appearance. Um, no. Wait, what, wait, what's the date? September 4th. Oh, this is gonna be interesting. <laughs> this is gonna be fun. Um, so, and then if Sean can get some of his uh, friends together who are interested in doing so, we're gonna do a TV party tonight on September 13th for uh, Insatiable featuring former Jesse star uh, Debbie Ryan. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, in addition to which, we've got TV parties for Legion, Cloak and Dagger, The Predator, uh, Damn You Hollywood, Iron Fist Season 2, and speaking of suburbanites and criminal situations, Ozark Season 2. We've got Metal Hammer reviews for Alice in Chains, Bullet for My Valentine, The New Clutch, Corpla Kalani, uh, Therapy with a question mark, and... Uh, Power Glove as we get into all covers all the time in our, in the month of October. Over on the comic side, we've got uh, X-Men Legacy. This is one of those shows where I hope you're not interested in hearing what the comic's about because we shit all over it. Um, we've got uh, Barb Wire, of course, the impetus for the on trial we're going to do. We've got, uh, Archie versus, we've got Archie versus Predator, the Snagglepuss Chronicles, the last Iron Fist story, and of course, uh, kicking off in October, our month of horror comics, Deadpool, Dracula's Gauntlet. So, um, lastly, the problem, the, there's also uh, loosely on the schedule a TV party tonight for the new Matt Groening show in the same universe as Futurama, Disenchantment, with friend of the show in our Canadian office, David Wright. So that's uh, all the things we got going on. If you're wondering what... We've had a shit ton of stuff go up this week. We've had a lot of stuff from source material. You know, Jesse went off and did his own thing with Evan Bevins. They talked The Thing. They talked The New Fantastic Four. Uh, we also put up our Zatanna show featuring friend of the show from Honeysuckle Rose Creations, uh, Alexis Haina. Uh, Damn You Hollywood did our summer wrap-up. Pat Mullen and I just recorded a TV Party Tonight Extra where we reviewed Earthquake versus Tugboat from the 1991 Super, 3, Super <laughs> Tape 3 I tape. I saw that. <laughs> and finally, uh, if you've been missing the, <laughs> the old uh, political shows here on uh, the Rattle Legend Broadcasting Network, Jesse Starter and I spent almost two and a half hours reviewing the new OTEP where we probably reviewed the album for about 20 minutes and the rest of that time was spent talking the politics of the album and you know and other uh, other topics. It was a law it was a it was a great episode, a lot of fun, you know, he and I talking about you know the Trump administration and whatnot. But uh, somewhere in there we also reviewed the silly album. So that's Otep Cult 45 on the Metal Hammer of Doom. That's all the stuff I've got to plug. Sean, do your plugs and take us home, buddy boy. Okay, everybody. Well, uh, for a change, I actually have some news to bring about. Uh, first off, earlier this afternoon, somewhat out of nowhere, I'd actually been working on it for a few days, I posted my first entry to my personal blog in close to a year. My first of what's hopefully going to become a regular series of them. Uh, head over to comercodex.wordpress.com. Uh, it's a very personal, introspective series, uh, much of it about recovering from depression for the past few years. Um, the title of the blog is The Reeducation of Sean Comer, part number one, uh, Wiggle Your Big Toe. Uh, give it a look. It's long, kind of lays bare a lot of nerves, but it sets the stage for a lot more that I plan to write soon, both 
in the nerdier variety and, again, in the more you know sentimental, deeper side. <laughs> uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Comer Codex anytime you want for all of my various geeky pop culture ramblings. Uh, over on my Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash Comer Codex, I'm going to be on tomorrow night for anywhere from two to four hours, uh, starting from... And again, you'll want to check Twitter for this. Uh, depending on what I decide to do, I may start at 6 with some competitive Overwatch grinding uh, for my series The Forge, in which I try to climb my way up from being triple-digit bronze up to about as high up the ladder as I can possibly go. Uh, right now, I'm almost at, I'm about 400 points away from silver. So, might be an exciting watch. Um, and then starting from about 8 or 9 p.m. Central Time, I am going to start streaming uh, The Banner Saga 3 as part of my review for W2Mnet.com. The reason why I said that September 4th was going to be an interesting date is because that means that I am going to be literally recording TV, recording uh, on trial while I'm on the road. Like, while I'm, while I'm going to be either driving or a passenger, because I am going to be driving 18 hours from Kansas City, Missouri, to Salt Lake City, Utah, to go man, co-man, along with my, wonderf with my wonderful friend and traveling buddy, Carrie, uh, the Honeysuckle Rose Creations table at Salt Lake Fan X Comic Con. Uh, so if you happen to be wandering the convention halls, hint, hint, Robert Winfrey, if you happen to be stopping by, uh, come by the table, say hey. Um, <laughs> Carrie has said that she that she is thinking about possibly getting me a medieval-style cosplay to wear. So I may be in costume. If not, uh, look for the N7 Armor Stripe hoodie and the chap with the long hair sitting in front of a laptop or tablet. Can't possibly miss me. And uh, extra bonus points and many, many huge jet bear hugs if you will bring me by something caffeinated. Um, otherwise, that's about all I've got going on lately. Uh, most of those projects are going to be recurring. So, again, Twitter, at Comer Codex. I also have an Instagram at the same name, as long as you don't mind uh, workout clips and photos of my food, <laughs> whatever I happen to be cooking at the time. Uh, but otherwise, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Sean. You're not. Remember to always enjoy your burrito and never dull your colors for someone else's canvas. All right, thank you for joining us on the Rattle Legend Broadcasting Network's TV party tonight as we close the loop on all things Gen G. Cohen. <laughs> For Sean Comer, I'm your mandated reporter, and frankly, I'm mortified, Mr. Mark Rattledge. Be well, be safe, and behave. Welcome to the Total Wireless Store, where total confidence awaits. Our daughter's off to summer camp, and we're worried our network coverage won't reach her. Don't worry. You got this with Total Wireless. Our phones run on the nation's best 4G LTE network. It'll be like she never left. The nation's best network? I feel better already. Now you can focus on how you're spending your summer. Discover the Total Wireless Stores and get total confidence. The latest phones, the best network, all at great prices. Now open in Miami. Refer to the latest terms and conditions of service at TotalWireless.com.